Welcome everyone. This is a meeting of the City of Northampton Public Health Department um, Board of Public Health. Um, it is April 21st, 2022. It is 531. This meeting is being recorded. Um, we will start with a public comment session. And as a reminder, um, uh, for those who are here for public comment, we're, we'll, we will limit comments to two minutes, please. Um, and um, you don't need to use all your two minutes, but you're welcome to. Um, and uh, visitors also uh, don't have the option for video. Uh, so therefore, I can't see you if you raise your hand. So please use the reactions section uh to raise your hand if you would like to speak for public comment um so we'll start um public comment session now what is anyone here is there anyone here who would like to speak in a public comment session i do not see any hands right now anybody So you use the reaction button to raise your hand or anything that you do in the reactions, reactions section, I can call on you. All right, I do not see any takers. Meredith, do you see any takers? I don't, Joanne. Okay, okay. Um, last call for public comment. Okay, I see no one uh, here for public comment, so I'll close the public comment session. Um, now we will uh, open our Board of Health meeting. Would someone like to make a motion uh, to open the Board of Health meeting? I move to open the meeting. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor, Cynthia? Uh, yes. Suzanne? Yes. Laurent? Yes. And Dallas? Yes. Great, thank you. Okay, our Board of Health meeting is uh, starting it's 5 33 and i'd very love uh, very much like to welcome dallas Dukar to our board um and um just to announce uh, our members tonight are dr cynthia swopis suzanne smith um laurent levy dallas Dukar, and myself and so we're a full complement of five board members for the first time in many years um so we're really happy about that and we're really happy uh, to welcome you, Dallas. Um, so uh, as um, a welcome, um, I was wondering if our board members would be willing to spend a minute uh, for each of us to tell who we are and our relationship to Northampton, to the board, to whatever. Is anybody willing? Yep, I'm happy to do that. Um, welcome. Welcome, Dallas. Um, I'm Cynthia Swopis. I'm retired faculty at UMass, still teach online. Um, right now, I'm spending a lot of time co-chairing the Cooley Dickinson Patient Family Advisory Council. Um, been on the board, I don't know, Joanne, I think you and I are sort of runners up here. Maybe seven years, I'm not sure. Probably um, more. Mm -hmm. Okay, yikes. Um, and uh, <laughs> it is just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to work with there's many people on the tiles here, Vivian, Cherry, Meredith, uh, Amy, <laughs> Kelly. Um, this is just a great, great team. And it's um, it's an honor to be serving the community this way. So welcome. Thank you so much. Anybody else? I can go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I'm, I'm Lawrence Levy. I'm, I've been a resident of Northampton since the end of 2016. And it is my fourth year on the board. Um, in real life, I am an engineer. Uh, I do environmental consulting, working primarily on groundwater pollution and chemical exposure issues. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that means me. Uh, <laughs> hi, I'm Suzanne Smith. I am a physician. I was a public health physician for 22 years. Um, moved to um, Northampton 17 years ago. I've been on the board for 14 years. And um, the last two years have been 
very interesting and um, a real challenge for us. And we're glad that you're here to join us. I think it's nice to be able to catch our breath a bit and, um, and hopefully the pace will be um, a little slower so we can, we can help, on, help you understand what we're doing. Uh, I'm currently, I currently practice addiction medicine in Greenfield. Dallas? Uh, so my name is Dallas Dukar. My pronouns are she and hers. I'm the CEO at Trans Health Northampton, a new independent nonprofit startup in Northampton. We serve the needs of over a thousand now trans and gender diverse folks. We opened about a year ago. Um, I also am on faculty at uh, Northeastern University, uh, Columbia University, MGH, and uh, University School, University of Virginia School of Medicine and Nursing. Um, also serving on the board of uh, GLAD and uh, Healing Our Community Collective. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just really grateful to be here. I'm a nurse, psychiatric nurse practitioner by training. Uh, and um, I have a strong passion for public health and I think specifically the intersections of mental health and public health. Uh, and um, believe that that has really been illustrated also throughout the COVID pandemic as well. Um, so I'm just grateful to be here and here to listen and learn. And thank you all for having me. Great. Um, is everybody else willing to give a little talk about um, their role in the Department of Health? Meredith? Sure, absolutely. So um, I, pre-pandemic, used to watch TV every <laughs> once in a while. And I used to watch this show called The Voice. And when one of the coaches team was full, they'd be like, yes, my team is full. I am super excited to have Dallas joining our, our board. What a compliment and what an honor. And I am excited to learn from you, Dallas. Um, so thank you for, for giving back to the community and being here with us. Um, I had the opportunity to meet with Dallas uh, probably a couple of weeks ago and uh, we chatted for a bit and we got to know each other a little bit, with, which was great. Um, but I am the public health director and um, I have some of my staff on tonight that we will go around and introduce you. And again, uh, it's an honor. Thank you. Board members are wonderful, and uh, there's a lot to be learned from them and their experience, their wealth of knowledge. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cherry? Cherry? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Whoever wants to get in first. I can, jump in. I can jump in. I'm Amy Hutchins. I've been with the, uh, the health department for about uh, only a year and a half, uh, signed on in the middle of a pandemic, and I'm the assistant director. I help, uh, I guess, uh, manage the office in general, inspectional services, which covers so many things. Uh, went out on septic today, but we do housing and food restaurants and nuisances. Um, I work closely with the uh, vaccine clinics and our public health nurses. And I'm still trying to get the lay of the land of everything that we do, uh, the prevention team as well. So they, we do an awful lot. Great, thank you. You do do a lot. <laughs> Cherry? Hi, good evening. I'm Cherry Sullivan. And for the past seven years, I've coordinated Hampshire Hope, which you'll hear a little bit more about soon, which is the county and region's um, lead on addressing opioid overdose. And I also um, lead the prevention team for the health department. Thank you. Uh, Vivian? Hi, I'm Vivian. I'm one of the public health nurses for the department. They snagged me at the beginning of the pandemic, and I guess I'm still here. Um, a lot of my work focuses on uh, infectious diseases that we see locally. And I say diseases, big surprise, there's more of them than just COVID. But a lot of that work has been COVID for the past couple of years. Um, and then we do a number of other things like vaccination clinics and whatever other miscellaneous public health things that can come up that are related to nursing. And I do get to work with the inspectors on occasion. Thank you. Kelly? Hi, I am the uh, department assistant. I handle a lot of the uh, permitting for the different businesses here in town and generally the glue that tries to uh, keep the department all together. <laughs> Thank you. And there are many, many other staff members who are not on tonight. So thank you all. Um, 
So I think we'll start, we're gonna change the order of business today because Cherry has to go. So we'll uh, start with um, Cherry. So um, before Cherry goes, I just, mm -hmm. uh, I'm Cherry, I'm so honored that you're giving your time to us. She's gonna take us through her journey working with the Northampton Health Department from the first grant that we got seven years ago, it was a DPH BSAS grant, and she's going to take us to where we are now. And the reason that I asked Cherry to come on and, and take us all on this journey with her is because Cherry has recently resigned from the department and uh, will not be working with us any longer, but her legacy will live on. She has created an amazing foundation and she has, ah, uh, yeah, here I go. I know. <laughs> Don't do it because you're going to make me. I know. <laughs> it, it breaks my heart um, because not only has she been an awesome colleague, she's been a friend and a confidant, and we've just really worked well together over the last seven years and built this amazing uh, prevention team. But um, She's going to take us on this journey and I'm going to stop talking right now because I'm welling up and I don't want to do that on camera. So I've asked her to come here, not only to give um, Dallas an introduction into the work that she's done, but everybody else a reminder of the last seven years and um, to have it memorialized on video was super important to me. So Cherry, thank you. Take it away. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'll start off by saying uh, my resignation was not, uh, you know, a, um, a lack of love for the department or the work. I did relocate to Vermont during COVID. And as things open up, I think it's appropriate, one, it's appropriate to have someone more local who has a better pulse on the community and can be more available for that really, really important piece of relationship development that we know is vital for the work of Hampshire Hope and our coalitions. Um, and also for those of you who know me, and then for those of you who are getting to know me tonight, you'll see that um, I am fueled by community connection. And living in Vermont, I thought it was time for me to start to build community and connection where I'm kind of stuck for a while. So, <laughs> um, so that's why I left. It was not for a lack of love by any means. Um, so I'll start off. I didn't, I didn't prepare a formal presentation. Usually I'm a PowerPoint sort of person and the reason I didn't do that tonight is because I didn't want to sort of get sidetracked um, and make it very formal because I think what's important if, when I share the story of Hampshire Hope and our work is that you feel it more than you necessarily memorize what we've done or what we've accomplished. So, and Meredith, you can chime in too at any point and, and also feel free to stop me and ask questions if you'd like, I don't mind. Um, so a little over seven years ago, the City Health Department applied for funding through the Department of Public Health um, through BSAS, which is the Bureau of Substance Addiction Services, for um, initiative money that was out there that was being driven to communities to start coalitions in terms of addressing the opioid overdose crisis. And so the city applied in collaboration with five or six other health departments around the county um, who committed um, as municipalities to bring on a coordinator whose role, and that was me, whose role would be to gather folks together in the community and take a step back and say, what, what's going on here? What do we know? Um, where are our strengths as a community? Where are our gaps? And how can we start to break down silos and really address this super important public health issue together as a community? Um, and so I came on a um, little over seven years ago and um, started off just by forming relationships with people, having an understanding of what, um, I'll use the word sectors, so think like agencies like law enforcement, hospitals, schools, um, behavioral health, healthcare, um, social service, et cetera, businesses. You know, what were their perspectives on this? You know, um, what do they know? How are they impacted by opioid overdose? speaking to people who directly may have experienced opioid overdose were at risk for it, as well as their family members, um, people in the recovery community. And bringing folks together literally at the same table to have conversations um, about what we thought our county could do better. Um, and also to think about um, what does the data actually say? Because we can come to the table with lots of ideas, but if it's not really, um, if it's not really driven by what our data says, then why do it? What we found out very quickly is that the data was lacking 
um, it was lacking both in you know, sort of in terms of what was available to help us understand the breadth and the complexity of the issue, but it was also lacking in terms of timeliness. So, you know, opioid overdose is, is a really timely issue. And, um, and when our data that we were receiving from the state was years old, it gave us a glimpse of what was happening in our community, but it didn't give us sort of what was, what was happening in that moment. So, um, through a series of lots of meetings and strategic planning, we ended up identifying a few key areas that we wanted to address the first several years. And one of them was data acquisition. And we worked really hard to think about, you know, who holds data? How do we use that data? How do we get that data? And how do we use that data ethically? And one thing that you'll hear me talk about, and if you come to a Hampshire Hope meeting is, we're constantly thinking about not you know, not just what could come, like the great things that could come from what we do, but what are some of the unintended consequences that could come from it as well? And that was particularly true with data. What are we gonna do with this data? How are we gonna communicate it? This is numbers, but it's human lives, right? These are people that we love and care about in our community. So understanding, and, and so one of the initiatives we took on was building a data system. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, then we focused in on youth prevention. We looked at what the data said about um, youth misuse of prescription drugs, particularly narcotics, looked at the data and partnered with our youth prevention programs and coalitions in the community and schools, and worked on bringing different programs to our schools and to youth serving organizations that we knew were effective. Things like evidence-based health curriculums, screening brief intervention and referral to treatment, which is known as um, ESPER, and providing a space to help administration understand what it is, why it's effective, why it's important, how do I implement it in my community, and then providing training for schools and youth serving organizations. We also did a lot on safe storage. Um, you know, again, I think a lot of the things I'm sharing in the beginning are sort of like common knowledge, old practice, because we've created a culture shift. But you know, safe storage of medication, um, disposing of medication, working with the district attorney's office around that. And um, then of course, you know, sort of getting the word out um, to parents about how do you even talk with, you know, kids in your life, a youth in your life, caregivers, grandparents, how do you talk with kids around substance use, um, substance misuse and, and, you know, the effects that it has on the community. Another area that we focused in on was um, law enforcement. And law enforcement came to the table. Um, I was really lucky in Hampshire County compared to maybe other parts of the state where they had a hard time, coalition leaders had a hard time engaging law enforcement. Law enforcement came to the table at Hampshire Hope ready and willing to think differently about their work. And so I spent a lot of time working with um, the jail, with the court system, probation, um, the departments across, uh, the police departments across Hampshire County to think about, you know, what is your current approach? Is it working for you? Is it not working for you? What could we be doing that's different? Um, and a lot of policy and practice shifts have changed in law enforcement over the last several years. Hampshire County has been a leader across the nation, um, so much so that we've been invited to national, very prestigious national conferences to share our work. And one of the things that stemmed from that was an understanding of um, the fact that police in our communities do respond to opioid overdoses. So in that moment, what could they be doing that's a little bit more helpful, that's a little bit more caring, empathetic? How do they bring that approach? Um, and it led to programs such as Narcan distribution um, through various law enforcement agencies. Um, and it also led to a program called DART, which is the Drug Addiction Recovery Team that the Northampton Health Department does house, but was an idea that came out of the coalition. And that program um, is where first responders do identify people who have overdosed or at risk or their family members and loved ones who would like support and refer them to um, our DART team, which is recovery coaches, harm reductionists, and first responders who are specially trained to reach out to people and offer support um, in a really person-centered, positive way. Um, one of the other biggest accomplishments we had was breaking down those silos, right? So people were doing really great work. Agencies were doing good work. They were moving along, but they were sort of doing it in these isolated pockets. So we came together to say, what are you doing over here? What are you doing over here? How do we start to actually align our work? Um, and that led to a lot of common language. Um, shifting the way that we think and we talk about substance use disorder, really putting people first. Um, 
and a broader commitment to bringing the work to the broader community. And we've done that in a lot of ways, you know, endless Narcan trainings, endless presentations in lots of different places. I see, you know, Molly is here from the library. Our libraries have been amazing supporters. Um, and we also have hosted for the past maybe three years with the help of Lori Loizel from the Northwestern District Attorney's Office, um, a monthly Hampshire Hope column. And that column has been such an important part of our work because it allows us to share what our community is doing, share the good work, but it also allows us to share the spirit of the work that we do and help to reduce stigma because we know that with substance use disorder stigma, which I like to also call oppression, is one of the biggest um, drivers of opioid overdose because stigma leads to internalized shame um, and therefore a lack of um, maybe willingness um, or even ability to reach out for support and help. Um, you know, and through time, my role was really continuing to bring together people. One of the things I think I, I'm most proud of that Hampshire Hope has done is that we have had really difficult conversations. Um, our original structure was that we had several different working groups. At first, it was by sector. We had healthcare coming together. We had law enforcement coming together, schools coming together, and they worked you know, sort of within their kind of own culture to shift. And then we started making it project-based because everything we did, we knew crossed all sectors of our community. Um, and then we would hold monthly, uh, sorry, um, like twice a year annual, sometimes four times a year annual coalition meetings, which would be big. We'd have over a hundred people. We'd have it at Hadley Farms when we were able to be in person. And we dive into some of those issues. What is next for us? Some of those issues include section 35, which is court ordered mandated treatment. And we really dove into what does that mean for our community? Is it helpful? Is it hurtful? What is our role? How do we feel about this? And uh, another example is overdose prevention sites, or you might have been heard of them as supervised injection facilities, and really rallying and understanding what this means for our community and helping to break down misconceptions about these topics. Um, and most recently, we held one on fentanyl and some of the mis uh, myths that were in have been in the public around fentanyl. So Hampshire Hope has really served as a convener. It's served as a source of education. And I really believe it's served as a culture shift. Um, and most importantly, it's served as a space where partnerships, trust, and um, new approaches have risen. Uh, the last thing, there's so much to say. So how is it evolving? So through time, um, uh, you know, we as a team, we wrote a lot of grants to be able to fund programs like DART, to be able to expand our work and offer mentorship to other health departments in other, um, in other counties. We're really seen as a leader and we've been able to offer our support and help share what we've learned and share our resources. Um, and one of the other really great initiatives has been our health information exchange, which is a HIPAA compliant um, database that lives in the city, in the health department. Um, which is fantastic because as health department um, professionals, we have a unique, I think a unique role, but also a unique opportunity to um, house um, data. Um, and so we have been building that for the past several years. And what that means is we think about what data would be most useful for us to understand who holds that data. We build the relationships with those data partners and we pull it into our system so that we can have a bigger look at um, at kind of the complex issues. We're not just looking at opioid overdose rates, even though those are important. We're not looking just at ambulance trips because oh, even though those are important, we're bringing in hospital data, um, you know, law enforcement, da uh, sorry, data from the district attorney's office, like all sorts of pieces of data that helps us get a better understanding of the landscape. And then of course, you know, bringing out and elevating the voices of people who are most impacted to bring story to numbers has been really important. So at this point, we have a great team. Um, we have um, two other uh, team members, Michelle and Wendy, who coordinate the DART program. The DART program has expanded to Hamden County, and we are supporting an adaptation of the DART program in Berkshire County. That's actually gonna be EMS focused, um, which is really neat because it's kind of a different approach. Um, but Berkshire County identified that they preferred to really have an EMS driven, um, ambulance service driven program for their outreach. So we've built this model that we can bring to other communities and adapt. 
Um, we have um, a two folks who are we call database managers. Um, Melissa, who is really sort of the database guru, the tech person, really understands how to build, maintain, manage, and, and provide quality assurance for our database. And then we have um, Austin, who is a relationship developer. He's the person that um, builds the relationships for that data acquisition, works on those um, data projects. He also works part-time for a, a national program, uh, national research study called HEAL that's in Massachusetts. Uh, you can look it up. It's a multi-million dollar um, research project. And um, he works part-time part sort of with them um, in collaboration with the health department around data for that research study for baseline data and evaluation data. Um, and then most recently, uh, little less than a year ago, we also brought a fantastic youth prevention coalition underneath the health department called the Northampton Prevention Coalition. Um, and that uh, coordinator's name is Kara. And um, that coalition had been around for 10 years. It sat in the school district in Northampton and it was funded through federal funding called Drug Free Communities, it's called DFC. And you can only have 10 years of that funding the city was really committed and Mayor Narkowitz was really committed, Meredith was really committed to maintaining this important youth organization, uh, youth prevention coalition. And so we brought that under the health department. And now that coalition is also part of our prevention team. So it's really excellent. Um, and Kara is taking a very um, important deeper dive into youth prevention now that the coalition has been around for a while and is really focusing in on issues around health equity and trauma and uh, adverse childhood events and sort of, um, you know, some of those deeper core root causes of youth substance misuse. Um, as a team, we have been um, during COVID really focusing in on our health equity work. We meet about weekly or we were meeting about weekly to have those discussions. Um, what does it mean, um, you know, power, oppression, all that stuff that relates to public health too. So, you know, what stemmed as sort of me <laughs> bringing together lots of people in the community as an exciting person coming on um, has really grown. And what's great about it is it has grown based off what the community has told us they need, want, and desire. And Meredith and her leadership in the health department and the mayor saying, yes, we want to be leaders in this. We want to be conveners. And we want, we, you know, we have the resources, we have the capacity. Let's do this well in Northampton. And by extension, let's do this, you know, across our county and sometimes across the region. Because I always say, look, you know, this doesn't have any borders, right? <laughs> like it doesn't matter. People, you know, we can do the great work in Northampton, but people flow in and out. They work in different places, they live in different places. And it really does take a collaborative approach to create a culture shift. Um, and I think we've done that really well in the health department in North Hampshire Hope. Um, gosh, there's so many initiatives, I can't even name them all, but um, you know, I've been really, really proud to, to, be, to be part of this coalition that has really changed the way we think um, about, about human beings, to be quite honest. Um, so Meredith, I'm sure I forgot a lot. I don't know if there's any key initiatives you wanna mention that I might've forgotten. So Cherry, thank you for that brief summary because there is there's a lot more that is behind the words that Cherry spoke about and we can talk about that at a later date. I just I appreciate that you gave your time today just to kind of give this quick narrative on the work that you started and, and what you're handing off and, and trusting in the team that we have. Um, but if the board members have any questions at this time, which I'm sure they do, I saw Lawrence hand already, I think, um, feel free to chime in. Otherwise, um, we can ad lib and, and talk a little more about the initiatives if the board wanted to hear about them. Thanks so much, Jerry. Really appreciate all your work as well as your presentation. Lawrence, did you have a question? You have to unmute yourself. I apologize, I was actually waving at someone. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> now the pressure to ask your question is on. <laughs> Anybody else question or comment? I'd like to uh, say something as um, a person who is involved in the addiction community in the Valley. Um, I remember some years ago that Michael Botticelli happened to be in town. I think he was transitioning from uh, his post as the drug czar in the White House 
to um, a position at uh, Boston Medical Center at their uh, Graken Center for Addiction. And I went to the, the presentation, I really wanted to hear him speak, but the person that I was most impressed with that evening was somebody I had really not met before named Jerry Sullivan. And I, I remember that, I met, remember that experience very vividly. I remember that you knocked my socks off and um, your passion and your, your, your grasp of this issue and the underlying forces and things that needed to be done were just so impressive. And um, I, I'm sure the, I speak for the rest of the people who are involved in addiction in the Valley. This is a big loss to us. Vermont's gain, um, they have a problem too. So I hope that um, you'll be able to help them uh, at least part of as much as you've helped us because it's, it's to hear you, you describe the program and I remember it was just you at the beginning. Um, it's astounding in a very short period of time. And I want, I want to thank you um, on, on my own behalf and, and from the board um, and from everybody in the Valley for everything you've done. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. That's very sweet. Anybody else? Questions or comments? Go ahead, Dallas. Um, I, I had just, prior to this meeting, I had just been cruising the website and learning more about Hampshire Hope. And I just wanna say how impressed I am with it. And specifically though, I really appreciated the uh, attention to psychological well-being and the focus also on bereavement too. And, and you know, those affected, you know, perhaps um, if someone's grieving, for example, after the loss of someone. And um, I just, it, it's very clear that Hampshire Hope and you in particular have been thinking about the whole person and the community as well. Um, and that's really just striking to me in such a positive way. Um, and I'm just curious, Cherry, if there's anything, um, as you kind of reflect, if there's anything that really stands out to you as something that you are very proud of, something that really just comes to mind. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You know, um, so I think what I've been really proud of is how Hampshire Hope became a launching point for a lot of um, both individuals who became strong advocates in our community, as well as local um, networks or, or local coalitions, right? So um, there are, there's amazing work, for example, happening in Belcher Town. You know, they have their own little local coalition. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of work that's kind of happened from that spinoff. And, you know, to me, that's the essence of the work, right? Because the goal is to build capacity in a community for then a community to have the ability to bring it to their own local community, adapt it how they need to adapt it, but then feel empowered to make a difference in their community. So, you know, when I think about what is the coalition, to me, it's kind of like, you know, a splatter paint, right? It used to be the coalition. And then, you know, more little dots. And now it's just like, you know, a Jackson Pollock where there's just all this great work happening and it's happening in a coordinated way. So I think for me, that's probably the biggest achievement because, you know, as you all know, this is not something one person can tackle. This is not something 20 people can tackle. This really does take a community. And I always feel kind of corny when I say this, but every single person in our community is part of the solution. And I always say, if you don't know how you're part of the solution, come, come chat with me because I'll find a way. Um, because it's not just what you do, but it's what you don't do that, that impacts the community. So definitely the way that this has spread and built has been, um, has been really, uh, really uh, important. And I think also reflective of the way that community is ready to step up if they're given space. Thank you. Anybody else? So thank I, you again, Sherry. No, I have a quick question, John. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> hey, I was just curious. Um, obviously, with the pandemic, we talked a bit less about opioid addictions. And I was wondering what happened during the pandemic. Was there a reduction and uptake? 
um, and also what, what are typical metrics to measure the effectiveness of, of your actions and the actions of, of the county? Yeah. Oh, I love the questions about data because this is where I skirt around it. And here's why I skirt around it. Data is so complicated, right? Um, the way that we interpret data um, could have so many um, variables that impact it. So I'll give you the example with COVID. Um, many of you have probably heard <coughs> stories on the radio or read stories in the newspaper that um, across the nation, overdose rates have risen pretty drastically with COVID for a lot of reasons. Some of that had to do access with treatment, some of that had to do with isolation, um, th things that people were feeling, um, sort of all the trauma that went around with COVID that exacerbated substance use. And in fact, the Department of Public Health has a uh, um, research out there that does show that in general substance use increase, not just opioid use. Um, but what's in, and that's also true regionally. So if you look at the counties around us, they also saw us, you know, an uptick in opioid, opioid overdose death as well. Um, a little bit around ambulance calls, but that gets tricky because one of the great things our coalitions in our region has done is gotten Narcan out into the community. People don't always call 911 after they've reversed an overdose, so we don't always know exactly how many overdoses are actually happening in our community anymore. But when you look at the Hampshire County data, we remain stable. And so if, if, you, if we said the goal is to reduce opioid overdose, we didn't meet our goal. But if we said during a really complicated time in which COVID has just, whew, it is a beast, right? And fentanyl is extremely potent in our drug supply right now. To remain stable to me is a win. It's a big win. So, um, so that's what this is what the preliminary data uh, coming out of 2020 and 2021 is saying for Hampshire County. We pretty much remain stable in terms of our opioid overdose, and I feel like that's a win. Um, other metrics we can look at include um, again ambulance. We used to use um, ambulance trip data. It's still a metric that we collect, but again, I think that there's a lot of reasons. Um, you know, there's also some of the unintended consequences of engaging with, um, you know, getting police really excited to do this work and training them is also that then folks kind of don't want police doing follow up or they don't want to follow up even when the recovery coach, they might be a little reluctant to call 911. Um, but also because there is so much Narcan out in the community, it's not, um, it's not a metric that's super reliable. Um, we can look at emergency room visits too. Um, but I think, um, you know, I think it is, a it is tricky to measure. Um, sometimes we'll look at things like data around Department of Children and Families, and what does that look like in terms of families that are impacted by opioid use disorder? And there's also treatment data that's out there. So if someone in Massachusetts um, enters um, addiction treatment, um, one of the, uh, the through the bureau through anything any service that's licensed through the through dph department of public health um there's like sort of this uh rating that says like what is the primary drug or alcohol you know reason that you're in treatment and what might be the other drugs or alcohol that are used and we did see through time an increase with people entering for heroin as their primary um drug that they're entering treatment for that data is still old. I think the last data poll I have is like maybe 2017, maybe 2019. So it's hard to keep up with it, but that is a measure. Um, and then um, Tapestry, our syringe access program also collects a lot of data. They collect the data of um, people coming in for their services, as well as um, they, if they report an overdose, we can collect that data as well. Can we measure opioids in the wastewater supply. We can. And in fact, um, there was, Meredith, you might have to chime in here. There was a, a researcher who for a couple of years, we put in a few letters of support for, because they can measure, um, yep, they can measure different opioids and they could measure, I think, naloxone in the wastewater as well. Do you remember what happened with that, Meredith? Because then COVID, so, and I think I lost it. Yeah, yeah. Um, we started, it was a, Biobot was a startup company through MIT, and they were, uh, DPH was doing this pilot for measuring this data, and we were accepted as one of the pilot communities to do this, and um, they, they, 
put sensors in three manholes in three locations to collect the samples from. And um, we didn't, we, I don't know what happened, but we didn't get the report or the analysis from the collection, from the, from the sampling collections that we were supposed to. So we're not quite sure where that ended up. It was brand new. Um, we were excited for it. We weren't sure how we were going to use it. Um, you know, maybe create some heat maps with it. We weren't quite sure, but yeah, there is. I think Biobot now is an, on the national map for you know analyzing wastewater for COVID. So it's come a long way since they first hit the scene back in like 2000, late 18, 19. Um, so it'd be kind of cool to kind of circle back after this and see how it can be used and how they've grown since then. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? And it was free back then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, Sherry, for all your work. You've been an incredible asset to our community and uh, it'll be a great loss um not having you around so but we wish you the best you of luck you get rid of me too quickly <laughs> she promised she won't change her cell phone number <laughs> i won't thank you again cherry uh yeah i can't thank you enough for your dedication your passion <laughs> the endless hours that we'd work to put in grants <laughs> at the last minute you were just and awesome person all around and it has been a true honor to have you as part of this team and to grow this department with so I thank you for everything that you've done you've taught us all well <laughs> thank you all right um let's move on to our favorite subject COVID. <laughs> um, Vivian. Well, what a self ash to follow. <laughs> I, I was told by Amy earlier to think of myself as the weatherman. Um, I'm giving you bad news, but it's not my fault. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to just share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's look at the last seven days in Northampton and Hampshire County. Um, <laughs> in the last seven days in Northampton, we've had 93 reported cases, and those are laboratory reported cases um, that does not include at home tests. Um, that's a 50% increase from the previous seven days. Um, and we've been kind of steadily increasing every week for um, about the last eight weeks. I, I, I have our increasing trends in the next slide. Um, so our incident rate is 45 average cases per day per 100,000 people. Um, we have a 14 day percent positivity reported by the state as 1.02%, but note that that's out of 13,987 total tests, which is approximately half of our population. Um, and that was the equivalent of 143 positive tests reported over a two week span. Um, we had less than five new hospital admissions in the last week. Um, and I do believe they were incidental. Um, for Hampshire County, we had uh, 515 new cases in the last seven days. Um, that's an 80% increase from the previous seven days. Um, our seven day case rate, um, which is not average cases per day, that's just the new cases over the seven day period. That's 320 uh, cases per 100,000 for seven days. Um, we had 4.1 new hospitalizations. Um, for the seven days, which isn't a drastic increase from the previous seven days. Um, and 3.2% of our inpatient, staff inpatient beds are currently occupied by COVID positive inpatients. Now the hospitalization metrics there haven't experienced the same kind of increase that our case um, count metrics have experienced. But because of our transmission metrics, we are now in the 
medium community level. The map has not changed yet, but I would project that it's going to change within the next 24 hours. Um, and then if we're looking at our old CDC um, stoplight map, um, our transmission risk based on that um, case rate is high, high transmission risk. All right, that was a lot of information. Any questions? So this community transmission risk category, which is what we call the old CDC metrics, right? Um, are high, we're in the red zone, even with um, the majority of cases not being reported. I read there's anywhere between, what we're seeing is actually somewhere between 6% and 30% of actual cases because of the home tests. Yes. Yeah, that's what I've read as well, is that we're probably capturing less than 10% of our total cases. During the Omicron surge, we were capturing maybe 40%. Um, and that's because of at-home tests and also just lack of testing. Um, people with you know, no symptoms or mild symptoms or even people with symptoms may choose to not get tested. So there's always been, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, we were capturing like a really small percentage of our positive cases because nobody could get tested. Now people are really just kind of choosing not to get tested. Um, so we kind of shifted. Um, so if I go to the next slide, uh, you can kind of you can start to see the the trend. Um, so really kind of steadily for the past six weeks, we've been increasing every week with the exception of, can you see my mouse when I move it around? Yes. That's good. Um, with the exception of these two weeks, we're kind of held steady for a couple of weeks. Um, there's been an increase every week. And then this past week was um, a pretty substantial jump of 50% from the previous seven days. Um, and then over here on the graph, you can see our big gigantic Omicron surge. It went down, it was still trending down for a long time. We did have a bit of a lull, but we were still having activity. Um, and now it's creeping its way back up. Any questions on this slide? All right. And this is Massachusetts. I thought it would be helpful to like look at this data because they also do, um, show trends in hospitalizations and deaths across the state. Um, so our percent positivity is increasing statewide. Our cases are increasing statewide. Um, hospitalizations are starting to tick upward just a little bit right there. And then deaths, um, as we know, lag way behind cases. They're still very low. And I think I read that nationally, um, they're the lowest they've been since the start of the pandemic, even as of this, up to the beginning of this week, anyway. Any questions on this slide? We're all just kind of over it. <laughs> okay. Um, so in an attempt to kind of capture more data, um, we are collecting at home test reports, which actually a good amount of people have taken us up on and we are collecting them, not just for um, Northampton, but uh, we do infectious disease surveillance for 17 communities in Hampshire County as part of our public health excellence grant. Um, so individuals from Hampshire County can report their positive tests to us. A number of people have done it um, online and I just showed a screenshot where you can do that on our website. Um, so you can submit it online, you could submit it anonymously. Um, you don't even have to tell me any identifying information about yourself because it's really just for data collection. You can choose to put your contact information and um, request follow-up from us, or you can just call me directly um, if you want that you know, one-on-one -on -one guidance or to share your story. We do get a lot of chatty people who wanna tell us everything about the history of how they got COVID and all the symptoms they're having. Then there. for the people online, can you give the yes. web address where they can report the results and your phone number to call yes. if somebody wanted to call, please? Um, so you report it online. Uh, probably the easiest way to navigate to it. I mean, the URL is a little bit lengthy, but it's northamptonma.gov um, sl forward slash 2104 forward slash um, COVID-19 dash dash information. But um, you can also just go to the Northampton MA 
uh, home, home page, if you just go to northamptonma.gov, and there should still be a pretty large COVID information button. And that's probably a lot easier than trying to memorize that URL. Um, and then if you want to report to me um, directly over the phone, no judgment, I'm very calm. Um, we'll have a nice conversation, um, chat about what's going on. You can still do that pretty anonymously. I would, I would know your phone number, but that's about it. Um, my phone number is 413-587-4919. I can say that again if you want. It's 587-4919. And I, I have had people um, call me directly too. So it's been nice. We've had that option for about two weeks and we've gotten, um, I think about 40 at-home test reports now between all of our communities. This is just for the past week um, as an example of some of the data that I am collecting. Mm -hmm. um, we just had six at-home test reports in the past week to supplement our data. And then Yep. Just a question here. Um, people who are reporting in, like one of the things, you know, oh, there's been a lot of miscommunication. People are still really confused. What does a positive COVID-19 test mean and what do you have to do for mm -hmm. isolation? Are those some of the questions that you're being asked or is yes. it just people just reporting and that's it? Like what type people of feedback, if any? want guidance from us. Um, which if they get tested through a laboratory and it gets reported to us through the traditional means, mm -hmm. um, through Biddles, the Bureau of Infectious Disease and Laboratory Sciences, um, if that gets reported to us through the traditional means, we'll do an outreach call regardless. Mm -hmm. um, if they do an at-home test report, one of the reasons that people may not be doing a test in the lab is they figured out that infectious diseases get reported to the state and they like the anonymity. So this is a way for them to, you know, be part of the surveillance process without having to um, share any identifying information or get a call from us in the middle of their day when they're already homesick. Um, but yeah, they do, I find that a lot of people do tend to be very confused about the um, Massachusetts and the CDC COVID and um, quarantine and isolation guidance because it is incredibly confusing and nuanced. So we're able to walk them through that. Great, go ahead. I have noticed that people who do the at-home tests tend to be symptomatic um, more often than people who are doing PCR tests. I think probably because PCR testing is in, um, the means for you know just general <laughs> including asymptomatic testing. That could be a component there that I found that interesting. Um, and then a number of them are reporting that they have other folks at home who have also started with symptoms or, or tested positive at home. Um, so, you know, for every person who's reporting to us, there's probably, you know, five more people who's, who are also sick. So, okay. Vivian? Yes. We have no access to any wastewater testing, do we? It's funny you should ask. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, as far as I can tell, as far as I can find, there is no public, other public reporting for wastewater except what is reported from the Boston Biobot. Um, and they have a North Shore report and a South Shore report. Um, and, but there are a couple of towns, I believe in Western Mass that are part of that system. And so therefore um, on the wastewater report, this is from Biobot, Biobot from Boston. Um, there is a Hampshire County line on here and I just can't remember and I couldn't find it when I went back to look which towns in particular um, are part of this system, but it's not many and it's certainly not most of Hampshire County. Um, there was a report, um, like an article about the fact that UMass um, is doing a COVID wastewater testing on wastewater treatment plant, I think it's in Amherst. Um, and I asked uh, Andrew Lover, who, who was an epidemiologist at UMass, um, who gave me this graph. Um, and I asked him if that was publicly reported because I couldn't find it anywhere. And he right. said, that is a hotly debated topic right now at UMass, uh, whether to um, put that information out publicly. So there's nothing public local that I could find. Meredith, do you know of anything else? 
So South Hadley participates in this program. Um, and I believe that's they're the only ones in Hampshire County with the exception of UMass. And I thought UMass was more residential life testing at the buildings versus Amherst, but I'm not 100% positive on that. I think in the article that I read, I thought it was a, a researcher who had sort of teamed up with the wastewater plant. So maybe, yeah. <clears throat> he used to participate in this um, oh, back in, I want to say October of 2020 and probably through February or March of 2021. Um, we could only at that point have one collection site and that was at the wastewater treatment plant. Otherwise, they'd have to enter the sewer system and they'd have to trace where you wanted it to be and how to get what portion of the city. It was very, very challenging. So anyways, they put the sensors at the waste sensor at the wastewater treatment plant and they would collect the wastewater on a weekly basis. And it cost about, I think, just under $800 a month. The um, problem that we had with interpretation was that um, our waste, the wastewater from Williamsburg fed into the wastewater treatment plant, um, obviously Cooley Dickinson Hospital, the VA, Smith College, and long-term healthcare facilities. And there was just, there was no way to exclude that data. Um, so when we looked at it, 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 it did provide us with an incident rate that would give us an indication on where we would be seven days out. Um, and it was kind of spot on. I remember I was super busy and and trying and and trying to really look at this data in depth and what it meant was challenging for me at that time. But I remember saying, oh, they were pretty close back then when they they gave us the reports. Um, because it was the number, the incident rate was the, the number of COVID cases equaled the viral concentration multiplied by the flow rate on the sampling data divided by the virus shed per the reported case per day. So it was, it was pretty, it was pretty interesting. Um, the, they, I remember that you know, from what I read recently that BioBot, they did, um, adapt their protocols from the CDC. Their approach relied on detecting genetic fragments of the virus that are excreted in stool by the qPCR analysis. Um, and it didn't matter if it was live or dead, or active, excuse me, live, dead, active um, virus. It still could detect it. Um, the limit of detection for the lab protocol was 3,600 copies per liter of sewage. Um, it could estimate reliably or detect the virus in greater than 99% um, <laughs> if there was at least one infected person per 65,000. So it was really, I mean, it, I, I felt at that point, and it might even be better, this is going back from when we used them a year and a half ago, it was pretty accurate and pretty impressive. But again, I remember back then, just kind of saying, how can we use this data to help with policy measures, right? Um, so anyways, that was a year and a half ago. I'm sure it's come a long way, um, but I'm sure it's also quite expensive and really does it have an impact if we're doing it in one community, you know, with all those other feeds into the community in one location. I swear Joanne and I did not communicate about this beforehand. <laughs> Vivian, that, Vivian that do you excellent. have that other slide? Excellent Thank timing, you. Joanne. <laughs> uh, so I also wanted to remark on flu cases. You probably heard that nationally. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I thought there was another slide about the wastewater. Oh, no, that was it. it. Oh, OK. Any other comments about wastewater? OK, go ahead. Sorry. Nationally, uh, and also in the state and locally, we've had an increase in flu cases really since the beginning of March, which is, it's not unusual to have flu um, this time of year in a normal season. What's unusual is that we had our, you know, beginning of our season in the fall, and then we kind of plateaued and had nothing. And then now we're having this 
kind of second uptick in flu cases. Um, so this national increase in flu activity and the local increase um, <laughs> is largely driven by influenza A or H3N2. Um, it's accounting for 99.3% of uh, flu activity in the country, um, according to the CDC. Uh, just last Friday, Massachusetts changed the influenza severity for the state to moderate. It was low before. Um, and influenza hospitalizations are higher than they were at this point during the previous two seasons, which makes sense if you consider the past two years. Um, but it's lower than the four influenza seasons that preceded the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, hospital admissions have been increasing, though, nationally each week for the past 10 weeks. Um, outpatient visits as well have been increasing slightly, but they still remain below baseline. Um, and this season, there's been 4.3 million reported flu cases, uh, 42,000 flu hospitalizations, and 2,500 flu deaths, 19 of which were pediatric. Um, as far as I know from our data, we, we have not had any influenza deaths here locally, but um, I'd have to look a lot more closely to be able to say that with certainty. Okay, and so I wanted to look at our previous seasons, PHE communities, just to um, clarify what that is. That's our communities, our 17 communities that were performed uh, infectious disease surveillance for in New Hampshire County. Um, so I like to include all of them because when we have this larger local picture, we have a pretty, we have a much clearer idea of what's going on than if we just looked at Northampton, because for whatever reason, you never know if people might not be, just not be getting tested for the flu, even if it's circulating widely in the area. Um, so our blue line here is 2018, 2019. That's kind of our last normal season that we had. Um, and you can see that there's still activity all the way up to May. And I think I really, um, no, I did report longer than that. I ran the report for the whole year for each, each season. Um, so we still were getting flu activity up, you know, until May, um, back in 2018, 2019. Um, and then this yellow line, um, is our 2019 to 2020. And you can see that flu just stopped being reported right when everything shut down, which makes sense. People started staying home. Um, they may not have wanted to go to the hospital to get tested for flu or COVID, or they may have assumed what they had was COVID and where it might have been the flu. For whatever reason, cases just kind of shut off. Um, but then uh, last year, we had such a remarkably low um, number of cases that I didn't even report for, report for. I think it was some, something crazy, like less than five cases for the whole year. It was very, very low. Um, but then this year we started having kind of a normal season. It was a little, a little bit earlier um, than the previous normal season that we had in 2018, 2019. And I apologize, my dates are a little scrunched together here, but it really started ticking off in November, went up. And then right about when Omicron took hold, cases just stopped going up. And then right around here, beginning of March, we see flu activity going up again. And then here we are um, on the 21st. Somewhere around when the mask mandate stopped, flu went up, right? How astute. <laughs> but you know what's interesting though about that observation is that would that makes sense for me on a local level. What's interesting is that this pattern is being observed nationally and there's uh, many communities, as you know, that have not had mass mandates in existence for months or, you know, really since the beginning of the pandemic. So it's, um, it's interesting that that patterns taking hold at the national level as well, um, including increased hospitalizations and outpatient visits. Yeah, I wonder if there's some competition between flu and COVID because it's pretty rare that someone actually has both. Um, so as COVID goes up, maybe we'll, maybe we'll see flu sort of stabilize. It'd be interesting. Yeah. Um, I have heard anecdotal reports from other public health nurses that they they have had co-infections. They call it flu Rona. Um, that's the official scientific term. Um, but yes, uh, co-infections do happen. They're less common, um, thankfully, but I, I wouldn't want to be smacked with both at the same time. Great. 
Thank you so much. Any questions? Any other questions? Cynthia? Um, yeah, I was actually going to ask, um, but Joanne, you jumped in there. I was going to ask if, if we can, if it's safe to say there is a direct correlation from the lifting of the mask mandate to the uptick in flu. Um, it sounds like that's anecdotal, or is that? Uh, I don't know if I would say anecdotal because we have the data, but it's it's a correlation. I don't. Yeah. I, it's tough because, I mean, if you think about it, before masks were lifted, there were so many communities that you could go to. You know, before we lifted our mask mandate, where you could, you know, it was a free for all, and you know that was local and that was national too, and they were also experiencing this lull in cases. And I, I'm wondering if. Perhaps part of it was that it really does line up with the Omicron surge. Maybe people had the flu during that time and just assumed what they had was Omicron and weren't getting tested for either. Um, there could be a lot of factors, but what's interesting is the rise in hospitalizations. You would think that the hospitalizations would be consistent during that whole time if flu was still consistent. I guess, I guess um, is this your last slide, Vivian? Because I had a broader question. Uh, yes, it is. Um, I, I guess what I, you know, would like, like you to give your opinion on and also other board members, it's just that um, we are now weeks, weeks into increases in everything. And um, I just need to have us consider or think about uh, when do we do something? <laughs> And I know we're in we're in this sort of stage of COVID is behind us because people are vac vaccinated. Um, but is there a tipping point? Is there a number? Is there a condition where we might have to um, do something different? And I'm I'm particularly looking at masks here. Um, it's not that I want to, but I do think as a board. <laughs> we need to be prepared for that because if the, this trend, the, just the trend lines as they were occurring in the same direction last year, we were reacting. And, um, and so there's a lot of, it's a di little bit of a different scenario now with, with more vaccinations and testing. Well, it's at the at-home test. I'm, I'm just concerned. I'm just concerned how many more weeks we will sustain this and we're not doing anything, or at least let me say having that conversation about what to do. Is there any reaction to, to my concerns at all? Well, I'm, I guess I'll start and then have Joanne jump in here. Um, we expected there to be an uptick. I don't think we're going to see a surge like we saw in December and January. Um, I think the feeling amongst epidemiologists or the ones that I'm speaking with at DPH is that, you know, within those 10 weeks of the Omicron surge, 50% uh, thereabouts um, actually got Omicron. And then with the real good vaccination rates that we have and the extremely good booster rates that we have here in Hampshire County, I think we were number one on the state map for booster rates um, a couple weeks ago that there is a good buffer and this really shouldn't be that concerning. Again, expected an uptick, but shouldn't be overly concerned at this point. With that being said, I do sit on the, the, the school committee, advisory committee, and we kind of set that, that tipping point, Cynthia, and I believe, um, and Viv, help me if I'm misremembering this, but, it was if the um, Hampshire County went back into the red on the CDC disease risk map, then it would be an automatic trigger for masks to go back on the kids. Is that correct, Viv? I honestly am having trouble remembering that. Um, I, Meredith, I, are you saying that by the old CDC metrics or the new ones? The new ones. The new metrics. So we're in the yellow now. Vivian, mm -hmm. could you stop sharing, please, so we can see oh, each other? Yeah. Be a little, be a little bigger. Yeah. Okay. Um, what I can say is that epidemiology, uh, epidemiologists and state and other epidemiologists are also hesitant to um, endorse specific metrics for policy decisions, is that, especially those that are based 
around cases, um, because as we know that case, cases are, I mean, the case counts are not telling us much except for trends. Um, so it could be really important for us to look at trends and it could also be really important for us to look at um, hospitalizations. The issue with hospitalizations though is they do lag a bit. Um, so that, that can make it tough to make determinations based only on hospitalizations. And I think that's what they were trying to get at with the community levels, but. I don't think hospitalizations are accurate uh, because now we have excellent uh, outpatient therapies that keep people out of the hospital. So I'm finding that despite these facts of uh, having a, a obviously an uptick in community transmission, we have very few hospitalizations, which is great news, but it just means it's that's not an accurate um, data point to follow. Yeah, and I think that's another argument for why this new increase in cases is different from previous. I mean, we have vaccinations, we have outpatient treatments, we have pre-exposure treatments, we have inpatient hospitalization treatments. Um, the only solid um, metric that we have is the surveillance that are that's being done at schools. We don't, you know, um, we're still doing pool testing there. Um, the colleges, higher education in the county are still doing testing. So we really don't have any good metrics to go off of. Um, it's just looking at the trends. What's so happening at the schools? Yeah, I mean, there must have been a conversation at the school for them to say, okay, when we go to the red, we're gonna put masks back on. Well, that was the recommendation from the SHAC, from the advisory committee. Okay, and, and should we be considering that as a community as well? I guess is my question. Well, the CDC does um, recommend that, that if you're in the red, that we mask up everywhere, indoor public spaces. So I would hope that we would be in line with that. Okay. Um, I know it's going to be a tough pill to swallow with yeah. the community. It was, you know, hard the first time, super hard the sec second time asking the public to do that. I can't imagine the third time, <clears throat> but yeah, that would be what I would recommend at least be in the line with the CDC. Yeah, and they do word everything carefully in the recommendations. They word it as the individual should mask up everywhere indoors. And then for community level interventions, they say, cons like consider precautions or something, consider taking interventions, but they don't directly endorse um, mask mandates. They were very careful about that. Right, well, they're illegal in some states, so they can't mandate from the feds, but. Um, so this, um, I guess I'm uh, agreeing that this warrants a further discussion, and I'm wondering if we want to um, have another meeting sometime dedicated specifically to this topic of metrics and sort of have a, a COVID roadmap going forward um, rather than just sort of, you know, meeting by meeting, uh, deciding what what we might do on any, at any moment. Um, so are we going to adopt the new CDC metrics? Um, there is a document uh, that was put out by some experts called the COVID roadmap, sort of how to move forward. So sort of when everyone says, you know, now we're going to live with COVID, what does that mean? Um, does it mean that the COVID is COVID is going away or that people aren't gonna get sick? So uh, the question is, what does that mean? Um, so I would advocate for, um, if there was just a subgroup of people who wanna gather, or my guess is that everyone's gonna wanna be involved, that we have a meeting dedicated to this topic and bring lots of data or as much expertise to it as we can. Anybody have thoughts about that? Go ahead, anybody, Dallas. I, I would agree with that. It, it sounds like it's just a, a good idea to be able to have some type of roadmap, some type of data, some type of understanding of, you know, what are kind of the, the trigger points or thresholds that we're looking for versus maybe going off of um, uh, a gut or, you know, um, where things feel they are in the moment. So. I just want to throw caution to the wind because this has been an ongoing discussion of ours for almost two years about setting metrics and setting roadmaps and 
we learned very quickly right when we were about to do that that something would shift and it just wasn't applicable anymore and i still feel like we are in that phase of covid that things could shift very quickly that what we know today won't be applicable next month i mean so i just want to throw caution to the wind there and i would rather kind of adapt just what we've been doing and if we need to meet on a more um, frequent basis because something new has emerged or the cases had significantly gone up, I would rather proceed that way than setting expectations and spending time and energy in setting expectations that could really change. And um, I'm just going to stop there. I just want to remind you, like, we've tried to do this over and over again, and we've spent a lot of energy and time and trying to create thresholds and metrics and, and what to do if scenarios for only them not to be useful a month later. Um, I was wondering, do we have any, I mean, is at this point the number of dead the most important? And are we trying to just not necessarily prevent COVID, but some people ending up at the hospital and dying from it? And I don't know how many cases we have in the county in the past 14 days, how many deaths within the county of the Northampton? I mean, are we gonna all mask up to prevent zero death is what I'm wondering. Well, this is why I think this is a bigger discussion um, that, that we could dedicate a discussion to this. Uh, metrics, goals of public health interventions, what public health interventions. And yes, I agree with you, Meredith, that that things may change. For example, if we have a new variant that's much more deadly, we're gonna change our thresholds or we're gonna do something differently. Um, but um, I think, I just feel like making decisions now, it's like, hey, let's just follow the CDC or, or I, I just feel like it, we need more data, a little more time and thoughtful discussion to decide how we're gonna proceed on what's happening now, right? We, our cases are going up. Um, do we need to do anything? Um, and if things are similar to how they are now, how would we proceed if things went up, if things went down? Um, knowing full well that if, they, if the scenario changes, um, that we would have to scrap it. But I think it's a worthwhile discussion anyway. Yeah, I, I, just, I just wanna make sure structurally, you know, we're not in a position of, we have to have a meeting, and then we have to craft a policy and we're wasting time. But if we just have that discussion about, uh, I mean, nobody knows what's going to happen. <laughs> and so it could be a subcommittee, it could be just an extra meeting. I mean, because this is not on the agenda, I raised the question, you know, and so before we make decisions, um, maybe we just need a meeting that where we discuss this. I, I, I don't know. I just, um, uh, the other question, infection control wise that I would have is that um, if you get a breakthrough case of COVID, are you susceptible to long-term COVID? Do you know, Joanne? I don't think there's anything known to be protective. I mean, vaccination is highly protective and decreasing the chances, it doesn't mean that it prevents. Um, I don't think people who have a breakthrough case have a, I don't know, the statistics on it, but I think anybody at this point could get long COVID. And that's another thing besides death is yeah. the, the is long COVID. So, and that's a, an area where there's not quite enough research yet and not enough answers yet. And um, that's, a, that's a tough one. CDC yeah. started a post COVID study. It, it's just a, yeah. it, obviously a debilitating disease and I'm not trying to over mask or over policy here. It's just to, to be able to have these kind of conversations. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what the goals of our interventions are is a real conversation. Um, so um, I sort of feel like we have some other things to do tonight and I would favor, you know, having another meeting where that's the main topic of discussion. How does that sound to everyone? Can we just simply put something two weeks from now and cancel it if there's no need? Yeah, one week, two weeks. We can talk about that at the end when we talk schedule. 
Does that sound reasonable? And then it will be on the, you know, on the agenda. I didn't want to put it on the, anything like that on the agenda today without us talking about it first. Um, but I do think it's worthwhile having that discussion. Um, okay, we'll put that on the end as uh, to discuss. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vivian. You're welcome. Um, Amy, do you want to talk about ventilation project? Hi there, everyone. Um, Joanne and I met uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a little over a week ago, and we talked about ventilation and air filtration. Um, thanks to Laurent, he did some detective work and found uh, someone that actually Josh Yearsley, who was in our public comment, who had offered to lend some time with initiatives or just about anything in the direction that we wanted to go to for um, air filtration in our, our businesses. And I, I, I think our focus came down to uh, small businesses, restaurants, especially in bars, um, given that when numbers go up, if masks go on, that's where people are gonna take their masks off and uh, pr higher transmission rates. Um, we kind of talked about, we've all done a little bit of reading about like what, everything that we learned from COVID is like healthy buildings now. Um, we did never really consider that. So there's there's lots of information about that. Um, Josh Year, Yearsley, point us in, in the direction of a UMass professor, uh, Rick Peltier. He's a air quality um, professor. And I think Joanne, when we talked, uh, that was gonna be one of your tasks to see if he might educate us and us being putting together like a small task force in the beginning to to you know learn about what does that mean what does it mean for our businesses what's the best way uh and and just get educated on it so i think we were hoping we could get maybe him or, or someone like him or and josh to get a small group of us and us being myself joanne maybe lauren uh maybe like one other board member uh, Amy Kaling did agree. She felt like she she would maybe pose questions coming from that small business side. And if I think what we talked about is that if we learned um, and, and we were more educated on it, at that point, we could potentially bring it to like the, the mayor level and our council members uh, level to see what type of ARPA funding we might be able to do to get to bring um, some funding to those businesses for air filtration. So the good news is that I did talk to uh, Professor Peltier and he's agreed to join a little task force. Um, and um, I also talked to Alan Seawald about the difference between a task force that it's like housed in the department versus a subcommittee of the board. And if we called it a um, sort of a working group of the department, we're only allowed one board member on there for open meeting reasons. Uh, if we have two or more board members working on a subject, it's then subject, then it's a subcommittee. Um, and then it is subject to open meeting law, which is a state law and um, public comment session, uh, which is a, a rule that comes out of the mayor's office. If you have three or more people, which is a quorum, then it's a board meeting. So we could have one, two, or three, <laughs> or more, <laughs> uh, various choices. Um, so uh, uh, how do you want to do this? I think maybe we should start as a sort of a working group at the, at the department level and just see where we go and see if it needs to come to a sort of a subcommittee um, of the board. So I, I would like to volunteer to be on that and we can get some experts together and sort of just figure out what our goals are and, and how we might achieve them. Um, I did speak with the mayor's office and inquire about the ARPA funding process. And they have, uh, the mayor has brought together a group or they're, I don't think they've met yet, but a group of people from various sectors, including small business and the arts and other groups to um, figure out a process for applying for the ARPA funds. Meredith, are you on that as for public health? No, I don't think you can be a city department and be on the committee. 
Yeah, I just wonder if there has anyone, any representative from health um, on that group. Anyway, I don't think they've met yet, um, but I happened to talk with uh, one of the mayor's assistants who said that they knew that ventilation was sort of a priority and was sort of, they had their eye on that. So that's good that someone's heard of this. <laughs> so um, also, I think that's, yeah. Also, uh, Amy Kalin and I came up with a super simple survey for those businesses that went out, oh, uh, what is it today, Thursday, maybe late last week. They, there's a April 30th deadline for it. And so far eight have returned. So that's good. Right, that was a survey was just asking sort of, have you made any changes to your ventilation since COVID started? If you have, what have you done? If not, why not? Right, is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. Why not? And um, would you be interested in education and training? That was another question. Find it helpful if the professor would present to us on the board. Um, I, I in no way want to um, diminish the importance of a task force, but in that we will probably have to be decision makers at some point. Um, I'd like to know up front what we're dealing with and get a sense of what the possibilities are. I think we've all been in favor of moving in this direction. We've all been in favor of, of ARPA funds. If we have it as a board meeting, we don't have to worry about the open meeting law. We can all be together, hear each other's questions, have a, have a common understanding. And, and that to me would be very helpful. That's great. I will ask him if he can present to us. That would be great. Educate us all. Any other suggestions, comments, questions? All right, so we'll start with a presentation to the board for edu on education about ventilation. Um, as well as uh, a little group meeting within the department uh, just to sort of get started and, and seeing what, what we have in front of us. He's aware, he's aware of where we've been heading with this, correct? I mean, I'd be interested in that session to hear some of his thinking about um, what's feasible, um, what might be something we should uh, look to to plan, um, costs, um, uh, specifically about this issue. Uh, if, if there, it, I would ask him the question, if there were funding available to assist businesses in their, in their, to improve their ventilation, what would he recommend? What would that look like? Uh, what would be the low hanging fruit? What would be priorities? Um, I'd be very interested in hearing his thinking about that. Okay, great, great, great. And if anybody else has any specific questions that you would want him to include, that may be a little bit more than uh, he can do right now, or but he can sort of give us some basic training to start, I think. Um, if anyone has any other suggestions, um, send them along. Yeah, I can just add to um, look up up in the air and you can kind of get his a feel for not specifically for downtown uh, Northampton, but like what what how he is and what he writes about. That's his blog. Yeah, up in the air. Oh, oh, okay, up in the air is his blog. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And his name is uh, Rick, Rick Peltier. Rick Peltier, P-E-L-T-I-E-R. Any other questions or comments about our moving forward on our ventilation project? All right, um, aerial mosquito spraying. We heard from the state that they've put out um, the, what is that? The waiver um, for aerial spraying like we did last year. And last year, Meredith filled out those forms and Northampton, um, <clears throat> we had we'd made a recommendation to city council that we opt out. Meredith filled out the forms and we were granted an opt out by the state, but a lot of other cities uh, were not granted an opt out. 
Um, and so I think uh, a lot of people complained that the state hadn't given them enough instructions and detail on how to adequately propose a plan that would opt out, but Meredith knew the secret sauce last year. So um, hopefully that would work again. Uh, so Meredith, do you think we need to make, take a vote or a formal, you want to maybe explain what it is sure, and then sure. if we need to make a, a recommendation to city council? Yeah, sure. So the Mass General <clears throat> Law allows municipalities not only to opt out of aerial spraying, but any other type of mosquito control spraying uh, that's conducted by the State Reclamation and Mosquito Control Board. So last year it kind of um, took everyone by surprise, the communities, and they were scrambling. And as part of this application process to get approved by the EU to uh, EEA, excuse me, um, you needed to have a comprehensive mosquito control plan in order for them to approve you to opt out. Um, fortunately, we had that. We had one, we were part of the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District where a lot of stuff happens like education and surveillance and um, uh, I think that's about it within the district. But then additionally, we were doing, we had contracted with a private company to treat um, wetlands and catch basins in the areas where people congregate where these mosquitoes, the vectors that breed disease, especially West Nile virus, um, like to breed. So we had this comprehensive integrated pest management program um, already nicely laid out and I just detailed it in the application and we were approved. Um, what happened was an unintended consequence of all these other communities, especially here in Western Mass that wanted to opt out and didn't get approval was they were clamoring at um, the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District's door to be able to become a member, where for years and years, because I was one of the um, five people who started this, um, this project, the Mosquito Project, um, we were you know, knocking on their doors for participation and trying to demonstrate the need and importance uh, of doing mosquito surveillance in your community and you know, they were pushing us away and this happens and now they're, they want in, but we don't have capacity um, to let them in. So that being a whole nother conversation and stuff we're working out with our delegates, I just wanted to plug that in there that, um, that this was an integral piece of an important piece of information, having this, you know, to, to um, be approved by Mass General Law and EEA. So anyways, this year, because of all of um, you know the people who complained about the process last year, this year they developed a simpler form, but you still have to have some type of mosquito control plan embedded into um, the application process in order to get approved. But there were different components that they're also going to look at this year. So one is regional, um, will review the regional historical EEE risk level maps. Um, and in 2021, the city of Northampton was at, determined it was at a low level risk of disease for EEE, which is Eastern equine encephalitis. So in order to even be considered for this year, you have to be in the low level for risk of disease of uh, triple E. So we hit that, that benchmark. Um, the second bullet that needs to be met on the application process this year is you have to prepare an alternative mosquito management plan, which includes at least three education and outreach activities. And it does give you a list. I reviewed the application because I'm sure I'll have to fill it out again this year. Um, what are approved educational and outreach activities. So, and we had to meet those last year too, not a problem. Um, the third bullet was you have to host a meeting of city council where a vote must be taken indicating that the municipality's intention to opt out of spraying um, was voted on and that the board of health was consulted in this decision. And then you have to submit this checklist, the mosquito management plan, and a copy of the certified vote to the EEA by May 27th of 2022. 
So I'm thinking today, um, if the board, um, Joanne, if you would like to do this, um, have a discussion on whether or not you as the board want to opt out again. Um, and then we could take a vote and then we can submit that to city council so then they can discuss it at that level. Meredith, I have uh, two memories of last year. One was that you had a, a matter of days yeah. in which to put this application together. Mm -hmm. And the other is that it was all in or all out. Mm -hmm. You could not um, uh, propose participating uh, partially in the mosquito <laughs> control program. Mm -hmm. You had to agree to everything, which is unfortunate, I think. But um, that's probably the way it is again. That's that's still true. So um, so the mosquito control program that we're part of is separate from this. Yeah, I mean, process. I mean the, okay. the state the state okay, opt in yeah, opt out. Absolutely. So I wasn't super supportive of it last year, and I'm still riding that fence because if there is a declared public health emergency for triple E, we're on our own. And if we had to, because there was severe risk of disease and triple E mortality morbidity rate is anywhere between 40 and 50%. If our Northampton residents were at severe risk for disease and we needed aerial spraying, we're on our own to do that. Whereas if it was declared an emergency in Western Massachusetts, specifically in our area, the state would take care of all mosquito control. So that balance, I mean, I know, I don't think it would happen here in the next decade or even two that we ever got to that level. That's more central and Eastern mass where they're at risk for severe disease because of breeding habitat. We don't quite have that here yet. I'm not saying that won't be the case in 10 or 20 years just because of the way that we use our land. Um, but right now, yeah, that's where I'm, I'm kind of troubled. If we were to be in that predicament, we now don't have that state resource. So I, um, what I remember is that we learned yeah, that it's, you're either all in or, or not in. And if you're in, it means we actually lose the ability to make a decision about whether we spray or not. And if the state decides, if we're in the state program and the state decides we need aerial spraying, it's aerial spraying, which covers like the entire town. Um, it's not local or, or identified places. It's the entire town and your pets and your lawns and your watershed, like everything gets sprayed. And it, it um, yeah. So, I mean, the downside is, and first of all, and I also don't believe that we'd really be on our own. You don't think the state would step in if there was a big public health emergency? I, I reread re it today. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. And then it's it's money, right? It's not that we couldn't access what we needed. It would just be a matter of that we'd pay for it instead of them. I think it would be both. I, I don't think the resources would be available. Where would we get the helicopter or the plane to do the aerial spraying? I, I just couldn't even imagine. Um, so the the same place the state would get it. They don't own those things. They rent right, them from but somebody. If, if, we're, if we're having a declared emergency for Tripoli e in Western Massachusetts, I'm thinking those resources are, you know, are gonna be needed statewide. I, I just, I put that out there just for you to think about it. Um, that's all, right. So what, what is your recommendation, Meredith? <laughs> So what towns, towns or city got spread last year by the state program? Um, they, I'm not sure, but they were all in Eastern Massachusetts on South Coast. There were some though. Yeah. Oh yes. And they, historically, they've been getting sprayed every single year since uh, 20 years. And yeah. by truck or with a B-52? <laughs> Not a B-52, but both. They do do um, uh, point source spraying with truck mounted spraying uh, most of the time and very few times have they had to do aerial spraying, but it has been done. We have never done that in Western Massachusetts. East Long Meadow did some type of aerial spraying about 
five or six years ago on um, fields that uh, parks and recreational fields because of um, trip, no, excuse me, because of West Nile virus numbers. And we did have um, one community in Hampshire County that had a horse that died of triple E, which raised the, the risk level up in certain communities, surrounding communities. Um, I remember there was discussion about the potential effects on organic farming in the area. And Cynthia, among others, spent a lot of time um, looking into pesticide treatments of grass and um, of the of the fields, the um, sport fields that the schools have. Um, boy, we that's a I wish I had I could be in the room where that decision making is is occurring. Um, uh, you have to take everything that we want to do and or you're on your own if you have a high rate of fatalities from, from uh, Tripoli. That, that defies understanding. I mean, talk about just a hammer to hit any nail. Mm -hmm. um, that's, well, I'm not in the room. I'm going to assume they have their reasons. Probably has to do with money. Isn't the state supposed to be our friend? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, Meredith, yeah. can I get a formal recommendation from you? No. <laughs> <laughs> damned if we do, damned if we don't. <laughs> That's my recommendation. <laughs> I'd rather have the resource and not need it than need the resource and not have it. And I said that was my exact quote last year when you asked me the same question, Joanne. Right. So <clears throat> the problem is that we give up our autonomy. We give up our choice um, <clears throat> of what to do mm -hmm. if we give it to the state, if we don't opt out. I forget. Is this an annual thing that we need to do? Yes. Well, then it is now. Yeah. Well, okay. So, I mean, we have Lindsay Sabadosa, we have Joe Comerford, um, say we say we do it again. And we, we work with those individuals to see, to Suzanne's point, <laughs> what's going on in that room mm. <laughs> and where this is coming from. That you, you brought up a very good point and I am working with them and I'm asking for money to support the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District that we have created. We have, I gosh, 36 members right now and we just don't have capacity to do the work, more broad stroke work than what we're doing. Um, I feel like we could get to a point if we had some, some more seed money that the communities that are part of this district, if we had some type of outbreak or an epidemic here in Western Mass or Northampton or any one of the member communities that we would have um, capacity and money to be able to take care of it. That's my hope moving forward as we grow this district and get some, some money in the coffers is that we can take care of our own and we could opt out and feel very comfortable if there was a declared public health emergency for triple E that we could resolve it here locally. But we're not there, but they do support it. And um, Senator Comerford got us, I think $150,000 to get um, a, a space, a physical space um, to rent, you know, for our superintendent. There's just, there's, we're, we're having growing pains. So do we need to give a formal recommendation to the city council? Mm, I think we do. We do. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't have anything written. I think last year we had more written information. So Dallas, I understand if you're sort of uh, not following this conversation completely. Um, do, do the rest of the board members feel comfortable voting on this? Uh, no, but is, we can vote. <laughs> yeah, there is an advantage to having been involved in all those discussions last year, which were under a lot of pressure because of the time sensitivity. Um, but there was a lot of input and, and a lot of uh, folks participating in that discussion, as I recall. And we voted to opt out. 
um, I don't know what has changed. It's still the abysmal choice of um, let us do whatever we want versus you're on your own while your people die. That's, that's a wonderful choice for us to be faced with. But I, I think we came to the conclusion last year that we wanted to opt out. And I, have, I don't see anything that would change my mind this year. And again, just as a reminder, it's a recommendation to city council. They have to make the big Understood. decision up there. Yep. Understood. The, mm -hmm. the, the recommendation to opt mm -hmm. out. And Meredith, you don't see anything scientifically that you would be aware of that would be changing our risk right now? So I actually feel like <clears throat> we're in a better position this year than we were last year because triple E is cyclic. And when we do have a high risk of disease, a year of disease, it's usually the next three years we're, we're at risk for more disease. So it is cyclic and we're now on the fourth year of our last cycle. So I feel like if we look at trends of the past that this year we should have less risk than we did, you know, the previous year. So there's that. Um, <laughs> should go to the casino together. <laughs> <laughs> but besides that, I can't provide you any more information. Anybody else? Thoughts, comments? Does someone want to make a motion? Uh, I move to recommend to city council that we opt out of the um, aerial mosquito spraying program. Is there a second? A second. Any other discussion? All right, so motion on the table to opt out of the aerial mosquito spring program. All in favor, Lauren? Um, yes. Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Dallas? Yes. And I'm a yes as well, Joanne. Um, that's all in favor to, for recommending to the city council that we opt out of the state aerial spring program. Great, thank you. Kelly, could you take that vote and send it to um, Laura Kruxler, who is the clerk of council, so she has it for the next meeting? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay, let's move on. Thank you, everyone. Um, senior center vaccine requirement. This is something that's still in place, and I thought we should revisit it. Um, anybody have uh, thoughts about that? feedback have we gotten from the senior center about um, what their their members are voicing to them uh, we we're staffing that correct this mm -hmm. health department is staffing mm -hmm. that so it so it's our folks who are interacting with people who come into the <clears throat> senior center so they might have some perspectives as well but I, I i i'm operating in a vacuum without understanding what's going on there Amy? Um, early on, it, you know, it was, a, we, we've been manning it since it started and, you know, it, they were a little, not confused, like, why do we have to do this? We already did this. But then the ones that we um, verified that they were vaccinated, that all we have to do is check their name. They still complain um, about it, some of them. It's a hard. It's hard to get a feel. Uh, we we had a couple of grouchy days this week. That you know, one gentleman just came in, would not show his card, and went right through. And uh, we didn't, you know, get very much support from the senior center themselves. The staff they kind of stepped back and let us do what we're doing. Um, we did get his name, and we you know we documented it. Um, that, you know, he, but he's in there. So it, it's a hard thing to police. That was our first time that that happened. Um, so I just wanna add though, that the senior center is currently without a director. So I don't think there's strong leadership there and the yeah. staff really doesn't know what to do. And we are staffing the table in the foyer 
with public health ambassador whose job is not to chase down someone who has entered the senior center without showing their card. That is definitely outside of their scope and what we're providing them. It was my hope when we offered to staff this months ago that we were buying them time to find some type of implementation process that was sustainable, right? You have to swipe a card to get in. Why couldn't they have something integrated in their software program that, you know, there's a red flag that goes up if you didn't show your vaccine card already, instead of someone sitting there day after day, you know, checking the vaccine card of everyone that comes in, you know, one of the complaints is I've already showed it to you, you know, two dozen times. Why do I have to show it to you again? And now anecdotally from the people, our ambassadors that are at the table, you know, I think it's like 99% of the people have had their card. It hasn't been an issue. You know, they do get a little kind of grumpy if they sh have to show it over and over again, fine. Um, the few people, there might've been four or six people that didn't have their card and maybe half of them just didn't have them at that time and it wasn't a problem and they got their card and came back at another time and then the others didn't have the vaccine or weren't boosted or something. So it's been a very small number. So yeah, I, I don't know how long we can do this. Yeah, and they only have to show their card once. Once that we, they, we've seen it, we put them into the computer. All they have to do is say, John Henry coming through. And really when we recognize them, it's like just good morning, you know, that kind of thing. So it's a hard mix. I know we this week uh, put together a survey, it hasn't gone out yet. To, <laughs> we could survey the members. I, I, I did ask uh, Michelle Dillman, who's the acting uh, director, I guess, acting, um, if she would be interested in, in putting that out to the members. We haven't, we haven't put it out yet, but it was, uh, you know, questions on the VAX mandate. Uh, do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? Do you have no opinion? Um, there was a few questions uh, about masking indoors. Uh, do you agree with it? Do you not agree with it? Would you feel more comfortable? You know, several questions like that. And then there was, um, to the people that haven't come back yet, uh, uh, quite a few questions just to see, uh, are they just not ready to come out? Are they, do they wanna, would they feel more comfortable masks? So that hasn't gone out yet and that might give, give us a better feel for what the, you know the climate is and, and what the, their, their members want. Some of the programs haven't opened yet. They're still opening slowly. So it could, it could be that is why they're, they're not coming back. They have 3,000 active members, and probably to date, we've um, verified about 600 or so that are using it. But about every day, someone comes in new that hasn't been there. So they're slowly returning. And, and one thing I, I do get from feedback, both from staff and um, kind of from staff and a little bit the members, our community is really different. Like say, so say like in comparison to the Holyoke um, Senior Center, they're full back, they're full blown. They've had carnival, <laughs> that kind of stuff. And I, I, I think our community is just, our, at least the members there are a little more conservative, so. So I, my question has been, when we lifted the mask mandate in the city, did that mean we automatically lifted the mask mandate at the Senior Center? Yes, yes. So, so we're requiring vaccines, but the mask is optional. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think your discussion at that point was, um, when we lift it, do we pick, we, do we lift it? Or do we say, we lift it, but you need to mask, and you need to mask, and you still need to mask. And that went to this, a little bit to the senior center, but also to like audiences and stuff, just to kind of refresh your memory. So don't we go back to the original reason why we put this in place? Certainly it was um, input from the members. I don't think the staff was ever embracing it, but we did it because we felt that that was a vulnerable population. Now, um, do we still feel that way? I guess is the question. I think the, the whole issue of us staffing it is a, is a, you know, that's, I can't 
imagine we're tying up staff to do that, but we offered to do it because the senior center was so concerned. But I think we also received a letter um, from the current staff at the senior center saying they wanted us to lift it. Is that, um, am I, did I read that accurately? Yeah, that was last month, I believe. Okay, okay. So, yeah, so we really don't know what the membership thinks of the vaccine mandate now. Um, I mean, we put it in place partly because we believe they are a vulnerable population, that it was a good thing to do, and that it would encourage that population to get vaccinated and boosted, um, but also because we thought the membership um, was in favor of it. Um, personally, I don't see any reason to change it, but I see that it's a, a hassle to, uh, to implement. Um, we also um, started the conversation when we were still under the understanding that, you know, vaccines reduce transmission. That's when we started these conversations. And I think we actually voted on the policy right on that uh, tipping point, you know? And it, so since then we've learned a lot. <clears throat> Right. Well, there's, there's no guarantee that even double boosting is going to prevent transmission anymore. Um, and I think people are moving towards individual responsibility of wearing a mask, N95 or KN95, to protect yourself, as it said in that article that uh, Joanne had about um, individual masking. So we can make recommendations to people that might in fact be more effective than requiring vaccination. We're not requiring uh, two boosters, correct? Or, or we weren't requiring any boosters, as I recall. No. One booster. Now, what, now one, okay. One booster. Um, it seems- I'm not, I'm not sure it's, it's having the effectiveness that we might hope. Yeah, hey, it seems to me that we're using a July 2021 strategy for something that's, and I think the ambassador probably would, could be used to, but could be put to a better use somewhere else. I'd be inclined to lift it. But should we, should we require a mask at the senior center? Again, that probably should be something that's left to the senior center to decide together. I mean, can they, I think that maybe that survey would be helpful. And or leave it up to individuals who want to protect themselves. Since they're, since they're leaderless, do they have a board? I mean, who, I mean, I'm just trying to understand who has jurisdiction over them. It's the mayor, right? Meredith, the mayor. Would... Right, they do have a council on aging board, but yeah, they do have an interim acting director and okay. I, the, the mayor's chief of staff is doing a lot of the work. What I'm, I'm concerned about is that we're gonna be kicking this can down the road each meeting and decide that it's all in well and fine to keep it. Whereas the ambassador could be doing some program outside over the summer as mm -hmm. opposed to checking vaccination cards. Mm -hmm. Awful lot of effort for something that probably has minimal um, 600 people. Well, I'm talking about um, of that, how many are unvaccinated? Yeah. Um, so all of that time and effort, a person knows, is being put towards um, checking on a handful of people for uh, a measure that probably is not preventing transmission. Well, that, that to me is the key, Suzanne. It's not the fact that we're, we're having the resources could be better utilized. I mean, they could be, no question about it. But are we saying that the mask and the vaccine at the senior center, the, those mandates are not effective in increasing transmission? Is that what we're saying? I just wanna make sure. I wanna clarify that with Omicron, that although um, vaccination, meaning full vaccination plus one booster does not prevent 
infection, it decreases infection by at least a factor of three. So it's not that it's not effective. It's just less effective than it was for previous um, varieties, variants. Do we want to wait and see uh, the survey results? Amy, do you think you can get that out pretty quickly? Yeah, I think it's ready to go. I made your edits. I think it, it looks good. Um, uh, it's just a matter of probably getting it out tomorrow and then putting a deadline probably to it. And I thought like a QR code might help in where they check in in their kiosk because they don't check their emails. And then I even thought paper copies or I don't know, a couple different ways mm -hmm. and see what, what we get. Does that sound reasonable? Do you want to wait for the results of a survey before we tackle this any further? But do we make policy or policy changes based off of how people are feeling about something? Or I don't know. I I I I, I like having information and collecting information, but is that something that we use in decision making and policy making? If we were to use the alternative, sorry. I'm sorry. Do you have a recommendation, Meredith? Hmm. I don't have a recommendation for the board, but I understand that the seniors are more susceptible, more, more vulnerable to severe disease. And I, everybody understands that. I feel like the Board of Health setting pop, uh, policy for this one small members only population in the city of Northampton um, just, uh, I'm trying to find the right political diplomatic words. It just, it, it, it didn't, feel good for me just doing it for that one place. When I think about our roles in policy setting, our job in public health is for community and not just one small, um, you know, isolated building um, where members go only in the city of Northampton. So um, with that being said, I, I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> I recall that we were hoping it would be an incentive for people to get immunized and then boosted um, in order to be able to participate in the activities. But like everything else, that's, that's a long time ago now. We're in a very different place. Mm -hmm. I think having people vaccinated and boosted is still uh, a basic premise or basic tenet of a uh, good public health around this pandemic. I don't think that's uh, an old um, principle. I think that's very a very active principle. No, I'm talking about this particular population. The, the information we've gotten is that this, that almost all of them are vaccinated. That it's, that it's a very small number that are not. And I don't, yeah, I don't think the policy had impacts on our vaccination rates. Oh, well, we had hoped, but yep. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, that's that's then. This is now. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not I'm not diminishing the importance of vaccination. I'm just talking about whether what we're doing. Why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we mm -hmm. continuing this? What 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 impact do we hope to get from this? And it sounds as though almost all of them are already vaccinated and boosted. It's a, it's a very small number and it's, it's one building in the city that has this policy and it's um, an awful lot of effort to enforce. Not that that's primary, but, but a lot of effort to enforce something to do what? I, I think too that um, I, I I agree with Meredith that this is um, 
is this our role to go building by building? And, and what really concerned me the last time was that the leadership did not see what we saw. The leadership did not see that this was a vulnerable population. And that's a shame to me. Um, and so we stepped in and we stepped in because members said we're concerned and uh, isolation and we wanna get back and we wanna be safe. And we responded to that. And, um, but, but now I think, you know, again, it's, it just confounds me why the leadership doesn't want to go in this direction. It's just really interesting to me. But I agree, um, you know, we, we care about public input and we take into consideration public input and we can still do the survey. Um, will it sway us one way or another? I'm not sure if, 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 the, if it is a fact that there is not as much of a risk as there was when we first put this mandate in, then I think, you know, I'm moving toward reconsidering it. But boy, I, you know, I, I, I wish there could be, you know, a requirement for masks to, to participate in the senior center. And if that's not up to us to do it building by building, then I wish it could be up to the leadership at the senior center, but I don't know if it is or not. And so the, they'll be pleasing some people, the man who walked out or the man who, you know, that Amy was telling us the story about, and other people, they will not be <laughs> happy about this. I think we have some information from the other survey that you did, Amy, about the response rate for the businesses. It, it's not, not very impressive. Not that you didn't do the work. It's just that's the nature of surveys. And I expect that's going to be the same here. You'll get people responding who are at the extremes of opinions, the people in the middle just say, I don't care, I'm not gonna spend the time doing that. So I don't, I'm not sure we get a represent, representative sample of the members anyway. How would you like to proceed? It, uh, is it acceptable for us to do a vote if it's not on the uh, agenda? I'm not sure. It is it on, the on the agenda. agenda. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry, as old business, but it's acceptable to, okay. I am tempted to wait for the survey as a matter of, as, as Cynthia alluded, alluded to, it's true we make decision on the basis of sound science, but we also get public input. And I feel that, um, if we take a vote tonight, um, some folks at the senior center will, may feel a little bit blindsided. I want to give them an opportunity to come to the next meeting and give their opinion, and then we take a vote. And we have that survey in hand. And a month is not that much time. But I'm inclined to lift it if we were to vote it, to vote on it. I'm interested. It, it was on the agenda for tonight yet we didn't get any public comment about it. So well, I'm, not, I'm not sure why people would come next time. Yeah, I, I, had, I had some um, phone calls and conversations. Uh, what did come up in the past two months or so is, um, <laughs> you know, are there any exemptions and things like that? And, and you know, they, had a, a strong case for themselves. And I, I always welcome them to come to public comment. So, you know, I, 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 I thought there would be some from the senior center tonight and I was surprised not that there wasn't. I'd be inclined to sort of wait until we get some pub, more public input and in the survey. Um, any other? Thoughts? Well, if we do schedule a meeting in two weeks, that's better than a month, but I don't know how quick the results can be turned around. I would agree with feeling more comfortable with some comment as well. Great. All right, any other thoughts or comments before we move on? Thank you. Um, minutes. 
Did everyone have a chance to review the minutes? Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Brief. I don't have a thing. I don't have a thing. <laughs> No, Not it's that's one. it's history in the making. Wait a second. No, no commas misplaced. No capitals. No, you know. Does anyone know of Kelly fainted? I just want to <laughs> note for the record, this is three meetings in a row that there are no comments on the meeting. So, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Kelly, Kelly, Kelly. <laughs> Would anyone like to make a motion? Move to accept the meet the uh, minutes of, of the last meeting of March tenth. March tenth. March tenth. Second. 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 Thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Cynthia. Yes. Suzanne. Yes. Lauren. Yes. Dallas. Am I allowed to be in favor if I wasn't at the last meeting? That's a good mm -hmm. question. No, <laughs> you abstain. abstain. Yeah. I would abstain. <laughs> okay. Joanne, yes. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think we've covered most of our topics. Um, so the next question is about future meetings. And Dallas, uh, you mentioned to me that you have some conflicts on the dates that were have been already assigned for meetings. Um, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I uh, also serve on the board of GLAD, and there are a couple conflicts uh, that I have. Um, and I don't have them exactly up in front of me. It's a. It's just. It's a couple meetings. Um, let's see here. Um, Is it, um, is it always the third Thursday? It, it is not always the third Thursday. There are some. Third you said June 16th, November 17th. Mm -hmm. Yeah, June 16th, November 17th, and December 15th are the three conflicts that I have. And then we had also talked about, so we, for May, our previously scheduled meeting would have been on the 19th. And actually, I am away that week. Um, and we had also talked about maybe doing something sooner that we could dedicate to COVID metrics. I'm not available um, on May 19th either. OK, so let's move that. Shall we move it up Sure. to sure. the 5th or 12th? Um, we've been doing Thursdays, um, Dallas, um, do you know the dates of your other meeting in May? Um, I do not, I do not have one in May. Oh, uh, I see that's yeah. okay. So, uh, the fifth works the best for me though, personally, um, but I could also do the 12th too. Anybody else? Fifth or twelfth? Um, I I prefer not the the fifth, but um, if we have to, I'll, I'll make an adjustment. Anybody else? Cinco de Mayo. If that impacts any decision making. <laughs> what was Mark? that, Meredith? What did you say? I'm sorry. May fifth, Cinco de Mayo. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you said you're going to be on the Nile River. Right? <laughs> um, the, the fifth is fine. Let's just go with it. Just checking my schedule. Yeah, either one's fine with me. Um, so the fifth is two weeks from now. So um, this is replacing May's meeting. Right. Well, it's an earlier May meeting, a question I guess we could decide at that time if we're going to want to meet again, 26th, we can decide then. Is the 26th available for everyone if we wanted to do that? If we, if we did the 12th, I feel like we'd have, we wouldn't have to do the, 
the 26th because it'd be closer because our June meeting's on the 16th. So. Well, Dallas has a conflict there, on June 16th. Oh, and, and that's right. Okay. Is gotcha. there any possibility that week of trying another day of that week of the 9th of trying another day besides Thursday or? In which month are you referring to? Uh, May, sorry. If we're thinking that trying to bring it back a little bit. Tuesdays and Wednesdays are out for me. Okay. In the evenings. Monday the 9th works for me. Works for me too. Works for me. I'm good. Lauren? That's fine. I have a conflict that night. You nope. do? Okay. But the fifth, people said the fifth did work for everyone. And the 12th works for everyone as well. Not so much. I, I can make the 12th work. Yeah. Fifth is your, you prefer the fifth. I prefer the fifth, but I can make it, I can make the 12th work. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think we're on for the fifth. Cynthia, that you said you could make that work. I, uh, yeah. And I thought that meeting would, be primarily dedicated to metrics and roadmap and sort of a bigger, at least dedicate significant time to talking about how we're gonna approach COVID going forward, um, unless there's something else pressing. Um, okay, so. Let's back up, let's go to, and not back up, but let's go to June. If we change the June 16th to a different day, then we could try to decide if we needed one in the middle where that would fall. Um, Dallas has a conflict on the 16th and where else would we put that June meeting? The 9th or do we wanna change the day of the week? I could do the 23rd or I could, or we could change the day of the week. I think we need an earlier one than the 23rd now, if we're meeting the 5th. Of May you're talking about? I think we're in June right now. So June was originally the 16th. We want to make it the 23rd as, a, as our standing meeting. And then if we wanted one between May 5th and June 23rd, where would we put that? On the, where did you say, Cynthia? The 26th of May or 23rd of May? Um, I didn't, I don't think I did say, but um, so for meeting the 5th is the 19th of May band. The 19th I'm of away. May? Yep. Suzanne and I are both away. Okay. 26th of May. Only we're meeting on the 9th, correct? No. The 5th. Oh, fifth. The, May 5th. Fifth. The 5th. Fifth. May 5th, June and, 23rd. And the 26th, you're saying? And if we want, needed May. one in between May 26th? I, I'm I okay promise I'm not this difficult to schedule. I just happen to also on the 26th have a conflict. Um, this is not usual. <laughs> and how about the 23rd? I can do the 23rd, 24th, 25th, any of those dates. Tuesdays and Wednesdays are not good for Suzanne, but Monday, the 23rd of May, if we wanted an in-between meeting. Anybody? Yes. Suzanne? 23rd is fine, thank you. Lauren? Yep. Okay, so we're on for May 5th, June 23rd. And if we wanted, one in between, it would be May 23rd is question mark. That works for everybody? Yep. Wh which day, sorry? Monday, May 23rd yep. is a maybe. Okay. How's that sound? And what was wrong with June 2nd? 
being about one month after May 5th. Well, it was one th a month after May 5th, but uh, we had a standing meeting on the 16th. Yeah, we could move it closer or we could move it further. You'd rather move it closer? I'm um, just floating this as an idea, but I'm not mm -hmm. necessarily. I So Sorry, I'm, from I'm out that I'm out that week actually on vacation. That the was week June second. Mm -hmm. The week of May thirtieth. Okay. So and the ninth, did we say June ninth? I can't do I can't do June ninth. I have an okay. out of public meeting. Uh, Monday, June sixth. Is there any chance to do? The week of the June thirteenth instead. Uh, oh, so a different day on that instead of the sixteenth. Mm -hmm. uh, Monday the thirteenth. Yes. Not for Meredith. Oh, but if we do Monday the thirteenth and June the twenty third, which was previously agreed upon, that would be instead. Oh, instead, okay. Just moving it a little closer up. Meredith, you can't do the thirteenth. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's out. So right now we still have May 5th, May 23rd, maybe, and June 23rd. Okay. I think well, we'll see how things go. Right, There's yeah. a surge. We'll you go over we'll those start thinking time. differently. Right now we're on uh, May 5th is our next meeting. Mm -hmm. May 23rd, if we feel like we needed another one soon. And then otherwise our routine uh, June meeting would be moved to the 23rd. Thank you. And do we think we'll have the survey result by May 5th and the ability to vote? Because if we decide it all as well, this mass mandate is gonna stay until, the vaccine mandate would stay until June 23rd. I can just make it a, sh I'm looking at the date. So it'll, it'll just be a short survey. Um, people who want to answer tend to do it right away, but we'll have something. Okay. Great. Okay. Any other questions or comments before we close? Would anyone like to make a motion? Move to adjourn. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you, everyone. And yep. we'll see you on May 5th. Stay well. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye.